Hello everyone and welcome to Mountain Lake Journal. I'm Tom Halleck. This week, the warning from scientists that another invasion may soon threaten Lake Champlain. More than two centuries after the British sailed up the Richelieu, there may soon be another attack on the lake. The invaders, an exotic nuisance species that for several decades have created nothing short of an ecological disaster in the Great Lakes. In recent years, quagga mussels have slowly been spreading along the Erie Canal and St. Lawrence River and are now lurking just beyond the northern and southern tips of Lake Champlain. What about the mussels? And it has become a major concern for nautical archaeologists like Art Cohn, who have long believed the best way to preserve historic shipwrecks in Lake Champlain, like Benedict Arnold's Revolutionary War gunboat, the Spitfire, is to leave them where they are, in the cold, dark, fresh water at the bottom of the lake. But now Cohn and others are worried that colonies of quagga mussels could destroy the Spitfire and have had a change of heart and believe the Spitfire should be raised from the bottom of the lake before the quagga mussels can attack. I believe and I have concluded that quagga mussels will come here, quagga mussels will entrust this boat, and quagga mussels will rapidly cause it to destabilize and become a pile of timber on the bottom. With the opening of the St. Lawrence Seaway a half century ago, global freighters have transported aquatic hitchhikers from around the world in their ballast water, including zebra and quagga mussels that quickly spread in the Great Lakes and have dramatically changed the lake's ecosystem. These two mussels are unique in terms of freshwater mussels in that they have what's called a planktonic larval stage meaning it can get sucked into the ballast tanks of ships when they bring in ballast water, and therefore the larvae can be transported to new regions. It didn't take long for the tiny mussels to have large-scale impacts on the food chain. In some parts of Lake Michigan and Lake Huron, the water is as clear as Lake Tahoe is, but that is not necessarily a good thing. It's basically an indication that it is devoid of the algae that forms the basis of the food web because the mussels are filtering it out. The invertebrates that live in the water column feed on the algae and the larval fish that feed on those invertebrates are now having a hard time finding the food to eat. The important thing about the mussels is to not look at them as individual fingernail sized species. You've got to look at them in their collective. When you do that, you see an organism spread across the bottom by the trillions. They're sucking the plankton, the life, the energy out of the water. When you have that much energy tied up in that many muscles, there's just not room for a, a lot of other stuff to, to have a go of it. On the shore, signs of the overabundance. Beaches littered with shells. And the mussels often catch a ride with boaters, who then spread them to new waterways. First, it was the zebra mussels that found their way to Lake Champlain in the 90s, and now quagga mussels aren't far behind. And that has a lot of people worried, given the impact they've had on the Great Lakes. The world's largest freshwater ecosystem is under attack. It's in the midst of a mass biological invasion, an influx of foreign species that's turning the food web upside down. The big question is, can the native species adapt rapidly if these changes occur too quickly. There are several species that have gone extinct and they're not found anywhere else in the world. They are gone forever. More than 180 non-native species have invaded the Great Lakes, competing for food and in many cases killing off native species. How lake scientists and researchers have been fighting back is the focus of a two-hour documentary that we'll be broadcasting this Sunday at 3 p.m. here on Mountain Lake PBS. And joining us now is Meg Modley, who is an Aquatic Species Management Coordinator with the Lake Champlain Basin Program, and Brendan Quirion, who is the Program Manager of the Adirondack Park Invasive Plant Program. Thank you both for being here. We appreciate it. Thanks for having us. Thank the you. documentary we're showing this coming Sunday looks at what has happened in the Great Lakes, where dozens of non-native species have invaded the lakes and are having a pretty major impact on, on the ecosystems. Let's uh, focus, if we could, for 
just a moment on, on some of the invasive species in the Great Lakes that are causing the biggest problems. So right now for aquatics, I would say we're really concerned about uh, the round goby, which is a little fish that's very similar to one of our native sculpin species. Um, we are fighting a battle with spiny water flea spread, spiny water flea, round goby, and then of course the quagga mussel um, has had a lot of impacts and it is slowly creeping towards our region. And that's the big issue, that, that what's in the Great Lakes is slowly creeping toward the Adirondacks mm -hmm. and, and waterways here. And a number of the ones you mentioned are making their way here. Yes, they are. And that's the concern. That's a concern and we are hydrologically connected to the Great Lakes system through canals. So we have the Erie Canal that connects to the Champlain Canal which could bring species up into Lake Champlain into the basin. Uh, then we also have them in the St. Lawrence Seaway. They could come down the Richelieu um, or up the Richelieu and then through the Chambly Canal into the Lake Champlain region. And then from Lake Champlain there's transport inland to inland water bodies in the Adirondack Park as well as in the state of Vermont. So that's what's so troubling. There's a number of pathways they can take to get here. And they have in the past zebra mussels which are in Lake Champlain likely that they came from the Great Lakes and used one of those pathways to get here? Correct, yep. We think that they've, we document them entering Lake Champlain in the southern end of the lake in the early 90s, likely coming in through the Champlain Canal and then spreading slowly northward and colonizing the entirety of the lake over a 10 year period. And as we saw just a moment ago, Art Cohn, uh, nautical archeologists, researchers worried about another mussel, the quagga mussel, that's yeah. knocking on the door and getting closer and closer and the fear what impact that could have on Lake Champlain. Yeah, and quagga mussels are not that different from zebra mussels. They're a freshwater mollusk. Um, they're an invasive species. They came into the Great Lakes, likely in ballast water, like many of the invaders in the Great Lakes that are spreading. Um, the challenge with quagga mussel is that they are they prefer their preferential um, habitat in deeper water than the zebra mussel and so the impacts to some of our historic shipwrecks that have been preserved in deeper colder water without zebra mussel um, interaction are would then become susceptible to a quagga mussel invasion. Uh, Brendan, so the Great Lakes also a pathway for invasive plants and, and other uh, invasive species to get to, to uh, New York State and the Adirondack Park. Yeah, in particular, forest pests and pathogens are brought to the United States most commonly through wooden packing material on ships. So um, the St. Lawrence Seaway and the New York City Harbor are both major ports of trade for the United States. And when that wooden pack material comes here, sometimes um, it can carry those species. And that's how species like emerald ash borer, Asian longhorn beetle, um, came to the United States in the first place and have spread from there. And those are two of the pests that we're most worried about right now. Uh, well, th three in, in particular. Asian longhorn beetle, there's been a success story with that. Uh, that's, they've been able to keep that pretty much to the Long Island area and keep it from spreading to the rest of New York? Yeah, so in New York there has been some successes with Asian longhorn beetle, especially in Long Island. Um, they, they're close to eradicating the species from Long Island. Emerald ash borer, unfortunately, is spreading across the state and it's really about slowing the spread at this point really promoting don't move firewood, use um, local nursery plants for your gardening and landscaping if you can to make sure that you're not actually transporting one of these species to your backyard. And we've seen the purple traps there in the trees that those are for the emerald ash borers to try to catch them to detect whether they're here and so far uh, they haven't made it right here to our part of northern New York but they are close by. They, they have uh, decimated ash trees in, in Quebec, especially in Montreal, and they're getting closer and closer. They're, they're literally across the St. Lawrence River uh, on the Aquasasne Reservation. They are, yep. So the Adirondack region currently does not have any reported infestations of emerald ash borer, but we know that it'll get here eventually. Um, our impacts will probably not be as severe as other places in the state because our, our ash trees, we don't have as many ash trees on the landscape as in other areas. I think our, our um, percentage of ash trees is about 5%. Whereas in places like Rochester, it could be 20, 25% of the forest. We've recently had a documentary on the hemlock woolly adelgid, which is another pest that is, is working its way uh, toward the Adirondack Park. And there's concern about that. That could, that could do a number on both hemlock and spruce trees. Yeah, absolutely. So that's one that I think is probably, um, could have the most severe impact to, to the Adirondack region. The Adirondacks do have the highest density of hemlocks of anywhere in New York State and potentially the Northeast. And hemlock woolly adelgid is slowly creeping north. It's as far north as, as Troy. And um, a few weeks ago, we actually discovered an infestation just 20 miles south of Great Sacandaga Lake. So it's going to be here in the next few years. Cornell University is promoting a program to actually raise biocontrol agents so that 
eventually we can release these agents on hemlock woolly delgid infestations to keep them in check. And that's a small beetle that, that may actually feed on the larvae of the, of the woolly delgid? That's right. So it's commonly referred to as Little Larry. It's um, a beetle that was harvested from the Pacific Northwest, which is hemlock woolly delgid's native range, was brought here and tested to make sure that it would only feed on hemlock woolly delgid. And um, now we can actually start releasing it in the wild, and it is, it is keeping hemlock woolly delgid infestations at bay. Our biocontrols uh, something that researchers are trying to find for a number of aquatic species? Yes. Biocontrols offer a tool in the toolbox, but we often have to approach management for infestations from a number of different angles. So we have purple loosestrife stands throughout uh, the region here that we've had very successful areas of using a beetle to help manage the plant species. Um, in some areas, we've had reductions up to you know, 50, 80 percent. Um, but in other areas, it hasn't been as successful, and we're not 100 percent sure why. There could be another predator there or some other species that's interacting with it, causing it not to be as successful. And we talk about stands of purple loosestrife. Uh, mm -hmm. People are so familiar seeing purple loosestrife, and maybe some of the other common invasive plants, uh, Japanese knotweed, uh, giant mm -hmm. hogweed, um, also Phragmites, mm -hmm. uh, becoming very familiar. How are we doing as far as controlling the spread of those? Yeah. Or is that still really a, a problem where they're just spreading out of control throughout no, the there's, park? No, there's some really exciting um, success stories happening in the Adirondack region. So when I first started back in 2010 with APIP, I think we had 16 infestations of giant hogweed that we were actively managing. And now we're down to six that um, still have plants. So we've eradicated 10 of those infestations. Mm -hmm. Similarly with Phragmites, we're managing, I think, close to 350 infestations within the interior of the park. Over the next two or three years, we're projected to have eradicated close to 70% of those infestations. So real exciting work happening on the terrestrial side of things. You, you do have opportunity to eradicate infestations if you find them when they're small and contained, and you have the ability to deploy resources when you need to. It's when you wait, do nothing, the infestation is already too large, that it becomes too late to really do any eradication work and then it becomes spread prevention. And that's the key. Uh, the, part of the reason we have you folks here and we're showing the documentary this week, this is Invasive Species Awareness Week uh, in New York from the 9th through the 15th. And okay. are there enough resources being dedicated to this? Do you have enough volunteers and groups that are working and is that making a difference? We're certainly always looking for more, but and we've come a long way since um, 2010, or 2008, I should say, when APIP was founded. We were the first partnership for regional invasive species management in New York to be founded. Now there's eight that cover the entire state. And um, so our resources and our volunteer engagement is, is continually to grow, and because of that, we're having a greater impact. And as you have success stories like this, are there new invasive species that are <laughs> knocking at the door all the time, and so do you constantly have to worry about what's the next plant coming in? Yeah, so we try to also engage in preemption, making sure that we're doing whatever we can to make sure that the next invader doesn't get here in the first place. Um, so really, you know, encouraging better policy for um, ballast water and for um, wooden packing material that's contained in ships. There are things we can do to make sure that we are reducing the risk of, in, you know, introducing something in the first place. And that's happening. Uh, there are steps being taken, there are laws being passed that, that really are trying to cut down on the invasive species. Uh, we've seen a great reduction in the number of invasions coming into the Great Lakes system and that tends to be the source of where most of these aquatics and some of these terrestrials are coming from. Um, and so our ecosystems, they are able to react. It's the rate of invasion that's really being um, the, the major challenge because one introduction after another after another can be a lot for an ecosystem to handle. So it will be able to react and we're hoping to s prevent the spread of the species that are here from moving into other inland lakes. And we've had a lot of great success with the boat launch steward programs and the greeter programs um, across the Adirondack region and through the state of New York as well as through the state of Vermont really regionally across New England and the entire country, there are a number of different programs. Some are mandatory with mandatory inspection and decontamination like we see on Lake George. On your website, you have your wanted list mm -hmm. <laughs> that shows uh, a number of the species that are already here that you're dealing with, maybe some new ones that folks aren't as familiar right. with that are uh, either here or on the way, and then some that are getting closer and not here quite yet, but uh, 
keep an eye out for this. So you would really encourage folks to go uh, really take a look at the at the wanted list. Yeah, absolutely. So we have a list of target species, which are the ones that we actively address either through our prevention programs or through direct management. So we always want people to know what they look like and report their infestations to us so that we can respond quickly. If we find them small, we can do something about it. Um, similarly, for the watched species that we have, or the wanted species, these are ones that aren't here yet, but we know could get here eventually. So we want people to be in, on the eye out again for those in case it does show up. And as we look at the list, is there any that jumps out that, that's more critical that you think may be getting the closest and that people should really keep an eye out for? Certainly hemlock woolly adelgid, um, given what we, what we spoke about earlier. That's one that is knocking on the door, and I think we'll probably be here in the next five to 10 years. So um, we're really worried about that one for our watch species. For aquatics, hydrilla is one that we would really like to keep out or catch early if it does show up. So that'd be one I recommend people keeping an eye out for. That and quagga mussel as well. And I think the challenge that we face is sometimes folks will find something or they'll see something um, and they'll come back and they'll let us know, but they haven't taken a sample. So if they see something, we really encourage folks to take a photograph and to collect the actual specimen so we can verify whether or not they have found something different or new. Um, so it's really critical. We only have so many resources to deploy on the field and the folks that use the waters are really our best resource to get out there. So if they see something, if they could collect it and bring it back to us, that would be the best.